Welcome and welcome to today's live session. Uh, today you're going to hear these live sessions are actually from fellows uh, for the New Zealand um, ecosystem and further afield. And it's to showcase what fellows have been working on inside EHF. And uh, today you're going to hear from two fellows and the team of experts that they have been working from um, inside New Zealand and from around the world. So it's the uh, stewardship um, session. So hopefully everyone's in the right session. So rethinking ownership. So hopefully you've come along to the right session. And I'm going to hand it over to Stephen Moy from C7 and he will introduce the uh, fellows. Kia ora koutou, ko Stephen Toko Ingoa, nga ao tatahi ao. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here this morning. Um, thank you all for joining. Um, as Michelle said, my name is Stephen Mo, and I'm based in Otatahi Christchurch. And I work as a lawyer um, looking at legal structures and things. And um, I have uh, been working to help pull this paper together with some amazing co-authors who are joining us today. Um, and I'm in um, C7 of EHF. And we're just going to briefly introduce each of ourselves. Um, not all of us are going to be um, sharing on the call actively, but but most of the co-authors are here on the call. So I'm just going to pass over to Natalie to introduce herself, who will then pass on to somebody else who can briefly introduce themselves as well. Thanks, Natalie. Kia ora. My name is Natalie Reitman White, and I'm in uh, the fifth cohort of the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. I'm based out of uh, Eugene, Oregon, as well as uh, British Columbia, and hopefully someday we'll be spending some time back and forth with New Zealand when things open up. Um, my background is in um, the food industry. I've worked uh, as an executive uh, in the food industry and, and ag sector in the US for the last 20 years. Um, and as part of that, my focus has been on sustainability. So how do we um, use the engine of business um, to create uh, better outcomes for people and the planet? And as part of that, I've started a number of trade associations for sustainability leadership and served on corporate boards and got very interested in this topic of how do we um, look at corporate governance and investment terms and ensure that we are setting them up to um, uh, kind of shift the goals and incentives to drive better outcomes for people and planet. So um, that's my, my current focus is uh, corporate ownership forms, alternative forms, and uh, different kinds of in impact investment terms. That's great, thank you so much. And next up, maybe Philippa, could you introduce yourself as well? Kia ora tato. My name's Philippa Wilkie. I'm a lawyer um, in Tamaki Makoto, which is Auckland. Um, I work in the field of uh, trusts primarily, so both trusts in a family context, but also trusts in a charitable context um, and with other non-profit entities, uh, some social enterprise. Um, and have um, collaborated with Stephen on a number of pieces of writing um, in this uh, growing and developing uh, area of law. Um, and so I will feed into some of the discussions today about the different legal entities that are available in New Zealand uh, and how we can um, man manipulate them to our benefit. <laughs> Thank you so much. And um, we have other co-authors who've joined us. Probably not all of us are going to be speaking because um, there's a lot to cover in a limited time. But Murray, do you mind introducing yourself as well? Because you've been a great contributor too. Thanks, Stephen. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Murray White. I'm at Avid Legal, a law firm in New Zealand. Um, my background is technology, venture capital, and ownership structuring laws um, and that's where I come in mainly on the, the, the company side and, and the alternative structures how to make these work and manipulate them as uh, Philip has uh, used the words um, for for different types of uh, impact investing uh, trying to uh, make sure we get different uh, stakeholders involved rather than the shareholder primacy that dominates New Zealand company law. That's awesome. Thank you. And the final co-author who's joining us is Susan Gary. Susan, do you mind introducing yourself? Great. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Susan Gary. I live in Eugene, Oregon, where I'm on the faculty at the University of Oregon School of Law. I'm a law professor with a focus on trust law and um, the law of charities. And 
I worked with Natalie to change our trust law here in Oregon to create a, a new type of trust that's a purpose trust that Natalie will be talking about a little bit later. Here in Oregon, we call it a stewardship trust because it's a vehicle for steward ownership. So I'm really happy to be here, listen in and contribute um, maybe on the chat. Yeah, that's awesome. Thank you. So we're really fortunate. We also want to acknowledge that Jan Hania couldn't make the call, um, but he had a massive contribution as well to the paper. And in the chat, um, we want to really use the chat function. So we've put up a link there. You can, if you haven't seen the paper, that's what we're going to be discussing. Um, and we'd encourage you as we're talking, feel free to start typing in questions, because we're sure that there will be questions that, that you have. Um, and we will be actively watching the chat and we'll be trying to respond, some of us, to the chat questions um, as they come through. Um, but what we wanted to do really, um, maybe we can go to the next slide, is we just got a limited window of time, but we want to run through a couple points um, that we think will set the scene for this paper, but also get into a bit of the detail. And also part of the challenge here is that we're talking about things which we don't think have been done in New Zealand. So we're really keen to learn from overseas examples and how things have been done overseas. And that's why working on this paper has been a real collaboration because as you could hear, we have Natalie and, and Susan contributing from the US perspective. And that's been really beneficial. So what we're going to do is have this, um, we, we've kind of through it now, the welcome and introduction. We're going to turn to look at available legal structures in New Zealand. Then we're going to turn to look at some models overseas. And then we're really keen to engage with you. It's a small enough group. Um, I think we'll be able to go on unmute from time to time and um, hear your questions, but also put them in the chat. And then we can have a direction that we're going. Um, we'll be finishing sharply at 11 o'clock. Um, we're not going to go over time, so um, make sure you get your questions in as we go as we go along. Um, and I think maybe one of the things just to say to set the scene um, is that this quote really represents what we were wanting to do here. And I think it's really important that we recognize we're talking about stewardship in Kaitiakitanga, because I think in New Zealand we have a unique aspect of our culture which is to our Maori. And so when we prepared the paper, we were really considering how can we actually, um, how can we actually bring that to bear in this paper? And so as this quote from Mark Prain um, illustrates, you know, this is a new lens to look at business for the future. And that's what we're really trying to do. We're trying to set the scene of what could business look like where we think beyond um, just who we are. And I'm really happy that all of the co-authors have come together because it's actually kind of unusual for lawyers to get together and to work collaboratively. So it's been awesome to work um, with Philippa and Murray and, and, and the others because I think that's an example. Um, the tone of the paper was set there. So I'd like to hand over to Natalie and if she could, she's just going to run through um, some thinking about how we're thinking today and the ways of thinking. Thank you, Natalie. Thanks, Stephen. Um, so I wanted to start off by um, how we framed the paper, which is about ways of thinking. And we believe, we posit that there are some shifts in ways of thinking that are occurring. Um, and there are some emerging concepts around um, legal forms of stewardship ownership. And I, I would argue that the reason why these shifts are happening are for a number of reasons. But the first is that as um, we globalize and as we uh, evolve uh, as societies, we are recognizing the importance of inclusion of more voices and more people um, from different backgrounds uh, holding power. And that that is going to be critical to uh, advance uh, society forward. And so um, I think embracing of uh, women, of indigenous communities, of people of color uh, is bringing new voices and new ways of thinking and ideas to the table about how we should uh, go about our work together and um, organize our lives. Um, the other shift that's occurring is not such a positive shift, and that is that we are seeing um, major uh, disruption 
um, in our in our lives because of how we've treated um, our relationship with nature for so long. And we're starting to see um, some um, undermining of our, our life support systems, um, which I think is causing people to question um, whether the way we've been going about things is really the best way. Um, so, you know, on the positive side, uh, inclusion of, of more um, people who have uh, more ideas and also on the negative side, some of the crises that we see, not only with the environment, but also extreme social inequity are causing us to rethink uh, a number of things. And as business people, I would say we're starting to really rethink the role of business in society. Um, you know, this, this notion, does, the, does a corporation exist to maximize value for shareholders or should it exist to maximize other types of value, uh, service to community and to create valuable um, products and services that, that serve people? Um, are profits uh, an end in itself or should we see them as a means to an end of producing uh, better uh, outcomes? Um, obviously we need investment and we need profitability to, um, help be some of the gas in the tank, um, but it's uh, not necessarily the end, uh, end goal um, to maximize above all else. Um, we're also starting to think differently about wealth generation, um, starting to think through a wider recognition of what wealth is beyond uh, just financial capital. What about other forms of capital that we want to keep healthy and wealthy, such as human community, um, care for um, and connection to each other, our, our relationship with nature and the wealth of nature. And investors are starting to rethink the terms of return. Is, is a three-year or five-year investment cycle really a, always appropriate? Should they be thinking more long-term about investments? And the kind of holistic outcomes of those investments for multiple types of wealth and capital. Uh, what are regenerative returns versus extractive returns? I think we're starting to rethink our place in the world, um, not as human centric. We're starting to consider the multiple stakeholders who bring value. So obviously investors are key, founders are key, but workers are key in bringing their life's energy to business, um, the communities that we operate in, the natural world. And we're also starting to shift uh, towards thinking about not just short-term horizons, quarterly, uh, profit and so forth and starting to think about um, long-term multiple generations and our responsibilities to not just ourselves today, but the future. So as we see these shifts, one of the challenges that business people and investors who are thinking about wanting to drive towards different outcomes through their businesses come up against is that the modern corporate legal and investment forms are structured on an old paradigm and an old way of thinking, which is the shareholder uh, primacy paradigm. And that is that there's actually a fiduciary responsibility of boards and most investment terms are structured around uh, profit maximization and shareholder primacy. So what we're looking at is how do we shift um, corporate legal forms and investment terms to uh, achieve different outcomes and what might that look like. So I will pass it on to the lawyers who can talk to us about some of the ways we're getting creative with hacking current forms and coming up with new forms. Thank you. Thank you so much, Natalie. And um, what we're gonna do now is do a little tag team um, Philip and I are going to run through some of the common legal structures that we see, and um, we're going to just explain really briefly what some of them usually uh, pitfalls, advantages, that type of thing. Um, so to start with, I'm just going to briefly mention the limited liability company. Um, and in the paper, we talk about this quite a lot, so I'm not planning to go into lots of detail. Basically, limited liability companies are well understood. People know how they work, how they operate. And um, in New Zealand, this is a common form that we see gets adopted for purpose-driven entrepreneurs um, because you can be quite flexible in terms of issuing shares to people. Um, you can be quite clear about what your mission and your purpose is. Um, I put a link to another paper in the chat where we actually looked at whether there were improvements to the limited liability company structure that could be made. 
And one of the things that we concluded there was that having to enshrine your mission and purpose was actually something that would be really helpful for purpose-driven entrepreneurs. Um, but that isn't actually required in New Zealand. You don't have to say what your mission and your purpose is. You don't have to have a constitution. Um, so that in, in my mind and, and others' minds is, is kind of a deficiency because um, it's very open and loose, but equally it means that you're not actually needing to commit to what it is that you're uh, about. Having said that, it's a very flexible structure because you can issue shares to investors, you can reward them through dividends, you can report on your impact, you can enshrine your purpose. So quite often this is a vehicle that we will see used for impact-driven entrepreneurs. Um, one of the downsides, of course, is that if the venture is successful, then there's likely going to be takeover offers and people may want to come in and buy the company, buy the shares. Um, and then it's very difficult for the original founder to lock in the bits that were unique that actually made it a purpose-driven enterprise to begin with. And a new owner could come in and decide, well, we're doing things different now. So that's, um, but having said that, it's a very flexible structure. We put it first because it is often used and it's often adapted for the purpose of, of the company. Um, yeah. So um, we're just gonna be tag teaming back and forth. I'm, I'm just pulling up here. Um, Philippa, do you wanna take over for the sure. corporate company? Thanks. Yes, sure, thanks. Um, so I'd just like, to say something um, back uh, relating to what Natalie was talking about earlier about uh, the shift that we're seeing um, in the psychology, I guess, of society these days. And I think I'm really representing Jan Hania when I say this, but um, I think he would say, uh, which we have reflected in the paper that um, Te Ao Māori has always viewed um, the environment uh, and people and community to be at the forefront of, um, of everything that they do uh, to the extent that they consider themselves to be part of um, the land uh, and, the, and, and the sea and the sky. Um, and so in some respects, we are really just catching up um, with, you know, the Pakia are, are catching up um, with a with a, a way that they have approached the world uh, forever, um, and interestingly, they have always used the um, the existing legal structures that we have and used them in a way that that works for them. Um, so I guess you know we're, Stephen and I are working through the existing options and how they can be manipulated. Um, and the ideal would be that we do have something completely new and something that's fit for purpose, where um, you both have a commercial um, uh, intent and also a social or environmental purpose. But until we do have that new model, we need to work with what we have and um, whether we use the word manipulate or adjust or adapt, um, uh, we, we need to use our creativity skills with, uh, with what we have. Um, so in terms of cooperative companies, they're quite special purpose. Um, they have been around for a long time. Um, we have a, a very, our biggest dairy production company um, is called Fonterra. Uh, that is a cooperative company. Um, they're all owned uh, um, owned and controlled uh, by members. So essentially every dairy farmer in New Zealand is a shareholder in Fonterra and every dairy farmer, instead of going directly to, to buyers, they um, supply their milk to Fonterra who on sells it to the world. Um, so it's, it's a way of um, banding together for a common purpose, common goal, um, achieving scale. Uh, so another example is our, um, some of our supermarkets are owned in the same way where all of the products for those supermarkets are purchased by Foodstuffs, which is a big cooperative company, and, and in turn they are supplied to um, the owners of particular supermarkets uh, all around New Zealand. Um, we also have mentioned in the paper Lumio, which is one of the um, social enterprise 
um, social enterprises using the cooperative company. So all of the shareholders are employees of the company and whether they be working in HR or PR or um, uh, IT or uh, actually doing the programming for, for the entity, um, they are very purpose focused. They have an excellent manual online about their um, cooperative structure and why it works for them. Uh, so they are different from um, what, uh, the, the type of uh, business that it traditionally has used a cooperative company. Um, I think that's all I have to say on cooperative companies. Stephen, do you want to go ahead with yeah, the LP? You. Yeah, no worries. Maybe we can put in the chat a link to Lumio as well, like their website or something. Um, also, just on cooperatives, there is um, a group, Ros Henry um, is, is leading it, um, looking at cooperatives and promoting them. And they've got a website. After I finish talking, I'll try to find the link and put it in because there may be people, some of you may be interested in, in that. Um, so I'm just going to look quickly at limited partnerships. Um, so limited partnerships, basically, they um, are sometimes used when there's a group of different entities coming together, um, and they uh, will have amounts that they put in for a, a common goal or a purpose. Um, they're usually, well, there will be a general partner, and the general partner is responsible for the um, liabilities and the debts, and then the limited partners are also liable, but only for the amount that they put in. Um, so there are actually some tax reasons why people would use limited partnerships as well. Um, where I've seen them used, they are quite a flexible structure. I've seen them used um, in impact investing type of opportunities. Uh, and you can have partnership agreements which describe what you're doing and kind of bring in some of these stewardship concepts, which is kind of the foundation of what we're talking about here, a new breed of entrepreneur. Um, yeah, but they are definitely an option that can be considered, but it's usually, um, yeah, specific, sometimes for tax reasons that they'll be used. Um, back to you, Philippa, to incorporate societies. Yes, yeah, so I just um, endorse what you said. So limited partnerships are traditionally used for private equity investments, which are, you know, it's a business where people are wanting to extract as much uh, uh, as they can from an investment um, process. Uh, but equally, they are um, now, uh, there are at least five, if not more, um, impact investment funds in New Zealand that are uh, limited partnerships. So you can have different um, types of limited partner. One might be a charity, one might be an individual, one might be um, another type of entity. And they, they are all bound by um, their governing document, which describes how why they exist, why they are um, joining up together. They can be there for a purpose. They can be there for a small um, financial return. They can be there for an impact return. Um, so limited partnerships are flexible. Um, incorporated societies are um, um, a legal model that are mostly used for amateur sports uh, and clubs in New Zealand. Um, I guess it's a little bit like the non-profit version of a cooperative company. Um, the members are not entitled to take any um, money out of the incorporated society, so it's only used in the non-profit um, sphere. The incorporated society can still make money, but it can only use it for carrying on its uh, whatever its uh, enterprise or purposes. It, it, it can't distribute that um, out to members, and obviously, it's not uh, it's not a viable choice for any sort of investment. Uh, that's me. Yeah, we're really trying to cover off a whole heap of things. Any one of these would easily be an hour long discussion. So just bear that in mind, this is a high level overview. B Corp status we put in just to be clear, cause it's becoming quite, um, people are getting more aware of it. So we wanted to acknowledge it as a really amazing tool, but it's, it's about a certification. You basically do an assessment, you answer a bunch, a bunch of questions, and then you can qualify to become a B Corp or benefit corporation. In New Zealand, we don't have a separate legal structure like there is in other parts of the world, like in America, where there's um, there's actually a, a benefit corporation 
type. Um, here in New Zealand, it's an assessment, and then you can qualify as a B Corps. The latest statistics I'd heard is that there was about 33 benefit corporations or B Corps in New Zealand. Um, but significantly, Kathmandu just became a B Corps. So they're obviously a very large entity, and that kind of maybe will trail, you know, trailblaze for others to follow. Um, also, Sinle, which is a large dairy company down here in Christchurch, just became a B Corps. So um, you're not setting up a new, a different legal structure here, but you are joining a cub of entities which meet certain criteria, which basically says you've looked at how you use your, your power, who you employ, who the owners are, all types of things to get a certain number of points to qualify to be able to say we are a B Corps. So it's actually a really useful tool, but it's not a separate legal entity. And Philippa, you're going to handle the next two. I so think. In, in terms of the, this heading is charitable entity. So um, status as a, a registered charity in New Zealand um, is just an overlay onto an existing structure. Um, so what that says is three things. It says that you have charitable purposes, you're for the public benefit, um, and you're regulated by our uh, charities regulator, which is our Department of Internal Affairs. Um, it also says that you have certain fiscal privileges, so you don't pay income tax, um, and there are some others, uh, and it can exist in perpetuity. Um, so historically, what was charitable was worked out um, in a trust concept, because a trust that wasn't for individuals had to be for a charitable purpose, otherwise it would be void. Uh, and it would be void because nobody could enforce it, whereas the state can enforce um, charitable purpose. So this is obviously still relevant for our purpose trust discussion today, but we will we'll come to that. Um, so as I said, we can overlay this charitable status now on a company. You can obviously have a charitable trust, but you can also have a, a charitable incorporated society. Um, so the difficulties with it are that you have to come within the traditional heads of charity, which are religion, um, education, poverty, relief of poverty, and anything else of benefit to the community. Now, the last one sounds fantastic, sounds very, very um, flexible and open, but actually even the categories within that have a tie back to a very historical piece of uh, legislation from uh, England. So it's certainly not uh, a sure thing that um, something that looks like it's being carried on for the benefit for community benefit, for example, will actually be able to tick the charitable head box. Um, the other element of being a charitable entity is that uh, private benefit is not permitted. So paying salaries, et cetera, is fine, but there can never be, for example, um, dividends paid to shareholders that are not charities. Um, therefore, investment is going to um, uh, be impossible. Charities would fundraise, um, have, they might have service income, but they would attract donations rather than investment. Uh, in terms of private trusts, moving on to that heading, <clears throat> so trusts are very flexible tools in New Zealand and they are prevalent. So families obviously um, use them a lot. They want, we are one of the um, jurisdictions in the world that has the greatest number of trusts per head um, of, in, of anywhere, which is um, <laughs> not necessarily something to be proud of, um, but they are very flexible. So, so you can, we are seeing more and more, and especially in an iwi context, um, trusts which are for the benefit of individuals, for people, for, for iwi, but they actually exist for a reason. So for example, they might exist to um, hold shares in a particular other you know, operating company, um, and they might that you know the, the the trustees who hold those shares are required to appoint directors to the company um, always in the best interests of the beneficiaries uh, and to vote on the shares in the best interests of the beneficiaries now historically what the best interests of the beneficiaries are um, has has usually has been um, defined as financial benefits but increasingly 
uh, and and we've had a um, a family trust court case which has um, emphasised this. Uh, the beneficiary's best interests should be looked at in a holistic way. So it's not just will they get the most money out of this particular investment we're doing. It's also does this affect the relationship between the beneficiaries? Um, is this something sustainable? Is this something that is short term or long term? Um, so it is possible to have a bit of a blend of purpose whilst still having definable beneficiaries, which means that you have a private trust that is enforceable by those uh, beneficiaries. Um, then dual entity structures. Do you want to do this, Stephen, or I can? No, you're doing great. Keep it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, in almost every scenario that we've looked at, especially in that second paper that um, Stephen has linked you into from the Impact Initiative, almost every social enterprise has a dual entity structure. So they would have both a corporate and a trust, whether it's a private trust or whether it's a, a charitable trust. And this, this really um, illustrates that we don't have one entity that can do everything that you need. We need to um, have two and, uh, and in that way you, you get the, the blended outcome that um, that you're looking for. So again, the EWE structure I was just referring to earlier, obviously that's, so they have a private trust that owns um, companies um, and it, it, it it seems to work well. Um, equally, it could be you could have a charitable trust owning the company, which uh, would um, be able to distribute any profits that came from the company out for its charitable purposes. Um, any other points, Stephen? There are some very good diagrams, actually. If you look in the paper, we've got um, the examples of either a charitable trust dual entity structure or a private trust dual entity structure. Um, it, the, the, the trust element does mean that the, the voting rights um, for the impact entity can be held and dealt with in a way that is for the benefit of either the, the charitable purposes or um, or for ind individual such as iwi. Yeah, and, and the thing is that I'm actually quite excited because this paper is certainly sparked in my mind, how could we do this better in the future? And I know Philippa and I and, and Murray and, and other like-minded lawyers are keen to explore this more and we would love to develop more templates and how this might actually work in New Zealand. Um, to do that though, I think we can learn a lot from overseas. So. Um, just before I hand over to you, Natalie, I, I realize we've gone through a lot of different legal structures. I, the picture that I give to people is imagine you're buying a car. You would go to the, you know, look at cars. Are you going to be going off road? You probably want this type of vehicle. Are you going to be cruising around the city? You probably want this type of vehicle. And it's the same when you look at legal structures. It's a little bit like looking at vehicles in legal vehicles. So it's important to get um, good advice about what's appropriate for your situation because not every vehicle will fit exactly what you want to do. So it's very difficult to just grab a template or say, well, that's the best option um, because every situation that I've come across has been very unique and specific and you have to look at the long-term plans of the people involved and things. Um, but Natalie, we'd love to hear from you because we wanna have a bit of back and forth and put your questions in the chat as well, everybody, and we'll come to those. But Natalie, can you just describe a bit of what you've been involved in? Because I think the rest of us have been intrigued and want to learn from what's been done overseas. Thanks. Sure, thank you, Stephen. So I, I'll share a bit about a uh, structure that I've worked on in the US and I'd like Susan Gary to add on as a lawyer. I'm not a lawyer, I'm a ownership and governance design consultant and, and have been um, a corporate executive. So I understand it from that perspective. So uh, the case study I'll give that is in the, the paper is I was working with organically grown company, which is one of the largest distributors of organic fruits and vegetables in the United States, been around for 40 years. Um, hundreds and hundreds of employees and, and so forth. And the company is 
uh, mission driven. The mission, why the company exists, was it was formed to help transform food and agriculture by helping farmers transition to organic practices and to create markets for those farmers to transition to organic practices. So they formed a distribution company that could work with the farmers on certification, technical assistance, and then um, packaging and bringing their, their product to market. So the way it transformed foods transforms food and agriculture towards more sustainability is to create good products on grocery store shelves for people to access. And um, so while, and, and it is a for-profit rather than a charitable organization, because the way that it carries out its purpose is to help farmers make a living doing farming in a different way and to help the staff of the organization, the truck drivers, the warehousers, the salespeople also make a living doing this. And uh, again, to economically benefit consumers as well in the marketplace. So, uh, so it's a for-profit business in that it creates change through shared prosperity, but it's not a profit maximizing business. The business had always operated in a way that it would take the profits that it was making and reinvest it back in itself to expand you know, services provided to the farmers, um, infrastructure, better marketing, more work on organic policy development, better wages and benefits. So the profits are continually being reinvested and shared with the multiple contributors of value to the business. But that was in conflict with modern corporate forms. Um, modern corporate forms, the board of directors are fiduciarily responsible to maximizing value. And one of the challenges is, is as um, our shares were held by farmers and employees, as you're successful with your business, the value grows and there's more and more of a pressure on the board members to look at offers to sell the company if it will maximize the, the value in the pockets of the shareholders. Um, also, um, the protections around them uh, maybe looking at reduced profitability by um, making some of these mission-related investments. So we were really interested in how could we create liquidity for founders, so founders who had built a nest egg by growing the company pay them back? How could we bring in investors to help grow the company without the risk of the underlying value of the company being taken and sold off as private property? Um, because the next owner might take the company a completely different direction, which would be away from the mission at which we had been fulfilling for 40 years. So how do you protect from change of control when you have changes in um, investors needing to create liquidity and so forth. Um, so we were looking for uh, a new structure for ownership. And we had originally looked at putting the shares in the hands of employees through employee ownership plans and so forth. But again, there was this pressure that um, those who are holding the shares could potentially cash in on the company at some point. So we decided to settle the shares, to buy back the shares of the company from the existing shareholders and move them into a trust that would hold the shares into perpetuity. Um, now the owner is a trust that will never die, never wants to extract any value or profit as the primary shareholder and directs the board of directors to run a financially viable company and reinvest the profits that it makes back into the company. Um, so the trust has voting control of the shares. And um, what's unique about this type of trust is it's a purpose trust. So Philippa spoke earlier about a charitable trust where the purpose is a charitable purpose under one of those four heads of, of charity. And usually that kind of trust owns a for-profit entity, takes the profits and then gives them away to the charitable purpose or we talked about a private trust, which is similar in that, except the beneficiaries rather than charities are people where the profits of the business is taken and given to people. In a purpose trust situation, there are no legal beneficiaries that are living human beings that can claim rights to the profits of the company underneath and the assets. In fact, in a purpose trust, the board is directed to take the profits and the assets and reinvest them back into the purpose for which the trust is established. So it's very unique in that sense. And so what it does is in your trust agreement, you can 
specify who has a portion or share of the economic rights and the profits. So you can have investment in the company and you can find ways to pay back investors a portion of the profits alongside reinvesting in your mission and purpose and sharing with other stakeholders who you might designate, employees, community, and others. So it's a way that you can have your control be held by an entity that is 100% purpose-driven, will keep the board focused on purpose and running a viable company. And then at the company level, you can have a de designated contractual agreements and stock agreements about how the economics will be reinvested in the purpose and shared with others on balance with that reinvestment in the purpose. Um, and it might sound really kind of out there, but our company was able to recapitalize tens of millions of dollars, um, moving the trust, uh, the company into the trust and bringing on impact investors who are interested in this kind of model of kind of a sustainable balanced return where they would get a portion of the profitability after it was also shared with other others and reinvested in the purpose. Um, and um, it this model is proven out actually we've studied for years in Europe there are some long term for profit companies that are highly successful companies like Bosch and others that are owned by these types of trusts that sustain the company long term hold the steering wheel and allow for a sharing of economic returns on balance with um, protection of purpose. So I'd like to invite Susan to talk about, because um, I think this, this could be a connection for New Zealand, is not all states were allowing of these types of purpose trusts. So we changed the law in Oregon to allow for this type of what we call a stewardship trust. Uh, thanks. And, and that was a really good explanation of how these um, purpose trusts work. The reason that we had to change the law in Oregon to make it work in Oregon is that purpose trusts are um, were initially created for not to hold businesses to um, for, for much smaller purposes, uh, like the care of a cemetery plot is the usual example, and so they weren't structured in a way that um, allowed their use for per, for for holding a business in two respects. Um, one was that in some states, and Oregon was one, the trust couldn't last in perpetuity. And the other was that um, the statute that we had would allow a judge to reduce the amount in the trust, which if, if the um, asset being held in the trust is a business didn't work. So we needed to change the statute to fix those two things. But in doing so, we decided to structure a stat statute that would provide guidance to people who wanted to use this type of trust. So in, in crafting the statute, we used the trust agreement that had been prepared for the company that um, Natalie described. And we were um, able to use that as, as kind of a model for what we put into the statute. Most of trust law is default law. Um, there are provisions of the statutes that are required, but those are pretty minimal and so the company's trust agreement can provide whatever specifics that company wants, but we wanted some guidance in the statute to make this a little bit easier for other companies to use. And I'll add here that as I have been talking to lawyers in Oregon about this structure, um, I've had interest from a number of different lawyers who are interested in looking at this model for clients, sometimes for companies like uh, the one Natalie described that's that's been pur purpose driven forever, but also for family businesses where the family founder, um, the, the whoever started the company is ready to retire, but maybe only one or two people, not uh, a whole group of people, and wants to have the business continue, but the next generation isn't either interested or isn't up to the, the task. And it's a way to be able to continue the business for the stakeholders and the family members can be stakeholders as well and might um, even have some financial interest in the business, but they won't have the control, the management, the voting power because that's held in the trust. So it's a really interesting tool um, in certain situations. Um, and as I think it was Steven said in the chat, it, it doesn't, um, you know, these are all different tools in, in finding the right tool where different businesses is, is important. 
pass it back to Natalie. Well, I think uh, it would, we'd like to hear questions that folks have and maybe some commentary from the New Zealand lawyers yeah, think, around these structures and how they might work, how we might achieve similar things in New Zealand. Exactly. And I think Michelle is um, having a look at the chat just to see if there's anything that we can pull out um, from there, but also type in your questions now. Now's your chance. <laughs> um, we will run out of time soon. So I think just a comment from me and then maybe Philippa and Murray as well, if you want to have a comment, just I, I do feel quite excited about the future because if this has been done successfully somewhere else, why can't we do it here? And really what we're putting the paper out now to do is to hopefully inspire people to try this and to, to try doing it here. And my sincere hope is that in a couple months maybe, or maybe a year, we'll do a part two of this paper and we'll actually talk about some examples which have taken on board the concepts that we talk about here and have actually implemented it. And there's something happening in the Waikato or in Invercargo or wherever it is that is actually taken on board the thoughts that we've put in the paper. And we've actually advanced the discussion because if we could unlock this, it would be really transformative for our New Zealand society. So um, Philippa Murray, maybe you wanna add a comment as legal, from a legal perspective, your, your thoughts about what we've heard from Natalie? Yes, I, I would just like to add that um, uh, trusts are used for quite a lot of different uh, purposes, and I use that in a loose sense, um, in commercial settings in New Zealand. So um, whilst we obviously have family trusts and there are charitable trusts, there are also, there's also a, a, a big pool in the middle um, where you may have a, a trust for employee benefit. Um, you may have a trust that's holding something um, for some people before it's transferred somewhere else. Um, uh, we also have community trusts, but they are products of legislation. Um, so I do believe in the flexibility of um, the private trust as, as an entity um, and the, the, the purpose piece has, it has been um, endorsed or given sort of elevated importance in, we've got a new statute coming in in January, our new Trusts Act, which refers to the context and the objectives of the trust in quite a few different places. And I think um, uh, taking sort of a step up from the that the, the context and objectives of the trust, provided that you also have a group of individuals or classes of individuals who could enforce the trust. Um, I think that we have uh, plenty of plasticine to work with. Yeah, good comments. I'm looking forward to seeing how that plays out. Um, from, my, <laughs> from, from my side, um, a couple of comments on just the practicalities of how, how you go through this. I think one of work, working with different groups, one of the biggest challenges is that a, a lot of people starting out on this path are working with new business models. Um, and when you're working with a new business model, there's some time that needs to be taken and identifying what stakeholders are at play, what the dynamics between the, the groups are. And really the, the legal structure flows from, from having teased those things out. Um, it's a little bit easier when you've got a, an existing business model and a more stable environment that, that you're working with amongst stakeholder groups. But when you're doing something new, it's, it, it's even a little bit more challenging. So for the people that are thinking about going down this path, um, putting in a lot of effort into what your business model looks like, what the various stakeholders involved will be, how you want to uh, remunerate or will reward different and, and share the benefits of, of the, the organization is really the key. And then um, it's, it's really after you know the landscape, then you can figure out what vehicle to drive through it using Stephen's analogy. Just conscious, there's a question from Barry Neal. Barry, did you want to um, unmute and ask your question? Sure, thank you. Great discussion. And yeah, it just um, 
I've been, as an economist, I've been fascinated with the role of externalities um, for a long time and studied them when I was in graduate school. And, and I'm just, I was thinking as I was listening to the description of the various structures and so forth, and maybe, maybe Murray goes to your, actually your last point, sort of what, what drives, what drives the structure it, or does the structure drive the, the business model? And I think you kind of answered that question, but I've, you know, we've been um, debating in, in the U.S. for a long time the idea of, of price, putting a price on carbon, for example, and the impact that that will have on the energy industry, you know, across multiple layers. It's in, uh, from producers to users. Uh, it's, it's, but it's, you know, a concept that's well-worn within the ranks of economists for a long time. And I'm just curious, you know, that, so that's a potential social good, if you will, or, so, you know, a social benefit. Um, but can it work the other way? Can structures drive, you know, sort of the policy making or the economic side, or does it come the other direction? That was the nature of my question, if that makes sense. Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, they're interrelated. Uh, ideally, the, the, the model that you're working with or the, the, the purpose drives the, the structure. Um, but what we find is because some of the structures are a little bit inflexible, um, over time, sometimes the structure ends up driving the purpose. And uh, yeah, maybe to Natalie's point about um, the organic farming example, where you have a group of owners, um, they, they might start off with good intentions, um, but you know, if, if they sell and change over time, the, the group that steps into the ownership shoes has the power. So uh, trying to dislocate in that sense, um, which, the shareholder and, and the purpose or, or put them together so the, uh, the purpose is the driving factor and can't be uh, bought out, for want of a better word, um, is an example of, of trying to use a structure to maintain the purpose. So there's a lot of interrelated bits there, but uh, ideally what you're trying to achieve drives the structure, not the other way around. Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree with that, that I think Unfortunately, we have entrepreneurs that start off with great ideas about how to change the world and they start building out the business model and then they go to seek investment and the investors say, well, I expect this market return and then they contort the business model uh, to achieve those returns and what happens is you might squeeze other parts of the value that you would have been creating. And so what I encourage folks to do is come up with a realistic model of how you what are the, do some heavy financial modeling on your business. What are you gonna need in terms of investment and what are you going to produce in terms of return and actually look at the full spectrum of return. I've worked with entrepreneurs to say, well, we could have a more extractive model and produce a 15% return, but instead we're actually going to make sure that 15% is divided with a portion that goes back to these different uh, sources of value creation and investors are going to get a chunk of it, but not all of it. We're actually going to take a chunk and reinvest it in some of our um, uh, technical assistance for farmers on soil building. And there's going to be credits associated with that. We're going to reinvest it in some of that infrastructure. We're going to reinvest it in the workers that are creating the value too, who often get shortchanged in agricultural systems from low wages and benefits. So I actually have worked with investors to do a presentation where they say, yes, this model generates a 15% return. You as an investor are going to get five to 7%. And here's the other returns that are actually going to go back in these tangible ways. And this is going to be the result. And so it's actually monetizing and demonstrating in the financial model how you will do that and put your money where your mouth is essentially. Because a lot of people say, we want impact, but then they say, but we expect it to be the market return. And a market return is often predicated on not accounting for the folks who get squeezed in the process or the externalities. Um, so I don't think people are bad people. I think it's a, a, a shift that needs to happen um, you know, in, in the minds of the investment kind of, uh, term setting. <laughs> Thank you, Natalie. Um, so we're actually run out of time. It goes so fast, doesn't it? So what I encourage the speakers to do is put your email addresses in the chat so that people can find you easily. And then that way, if someone wants to continue that conversation, at another time, they can email you and you can sort out other ways. But I hope you've enjoyed the session. And 
are you going to share, you've shared the document, so that's great, so everyone can um, connect in that way. I'll just give you a few more minutes so that you can put your email addresses in the chat for people to grab them before we end the session. But thank you very much for taking the time and for dialing in Susan from Oregon as well. And I hope you all got something out of that. And yeah, please, I know we ran out of uh, question time, but um, feel free to reach out to the team. They've done a great job. All through COVID, they were very cooperative, weren't they? It was great. Yeah, thanks team. And thank you to Michelle for uh, bringing us all together uh, to produce this paper. It was You're welcome, really appreciate it. Thank you for your organizing.